You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, hosted by Joey and Holly Baird. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is on the air, and it's heard on WNLV 860 AM and W293CX 106.5 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. WWDB 860 AM in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. WAAM 1600 AM and 92.7 FM Ann Arbor, Michigan. And KMET 1490 AM Banning, California. Coming up on the program today, we're going to talk about powdery mildew, how to identify the problem and what to do once you have got powdery mildew on your plants, as well as building cold frames for long-term extension season growing. And bug expert and horticultural professional Jessica Walliser from SavvyGardening.com will be with us and your garden questions. The hour is jam-packed, so let's start right now. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. So glad you've taken time out of your day to join us on the program. Whether you're in Milwaukee, Philadelphia, Southeast Michigan, Banning, California, or listening around the country or around the world via the simple radio app, the TuneIn app, or through the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com under the radio tab on podcast replay or in-studio video replay. Thank you so much for taking time to join us. I'm your host, Joey Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Baird. You can find all of our content at that website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, where there's over 1,400 garden videos, short and long format, of in-garden and in-studio of this particular radio show of all past shows. The executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show is Power Planter. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you. Create planting holes fast and efficiently with ease. No matter the soil type, it does the job effortlessly. Increase your root-to-soil contact. Leave the shovel and the spade in the shed. Hand-welded and made in the USA, we offer a lifetime warranty on product defects. Find the size that fits your project at powerplanter.com. You want to get a hold of us, you want to talk to us, you want to submit a question for us to answer, you can do that through the IV Organics Communication Hotlines. IV Organic 301 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn insects and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. You can send us an email through the Ivy Organics 31 plant email inbox, and the email address is twvgshow at gmail.com. You can also send in send us a text on the Instant Access Ivy Organic 31 Plant Guard Instant Access text hotline. Send your text questions to us at 414-368-9311. Again, that's 414-368-9311. In the garden, we have a lot of issues, diseases, bugs, and uh, problems that we face each and every year. One that is almost a regular visitor to our gardens is powdery mildew. And the term or the name implies exactly what the issue is mildew or a powdery substance that looks like it's appearing on a lot of your vegetation. What is powdery mildew, Holly? Powdery mildew is a fungal disease, so it's not it's it's not like harmful to you. It's harmful to your plant. You know you have it because on and I'll, I'll list off the plants here. You'll have these white spots on them, whitish, grayish spots, and then when you touch it, it is powdery. And then as the untreated area continues to develop, the white spots now encase the entire leaf structure which is suffocating the plant preventing the so- the sun from photosynthesizing right. it, through the plant yeah, the leaves it stops the photosynthesis process so the leaves of plants are what causes or what absorb the sun rays to make that photosynthesis what happen. are some of the plants well, in which yeah. we can uh, identify or have or, or expect or may see problems on so i just want to mention that this plant is host specific so if it's on um, your zucchini plant or something, it's not necessarily going to spread to your grapevines. So that's something you want to keep in mind. So typically it's... But it could spread from zucchini plant to zucchini right. plant, but not from zucchini plant to yeah. another plant necessarily. Right. Okay. Um, so this affects things like squash, so any sort of squash viney plant, including pumpkin, and then zucchini, grape. if you have grapevines... 
Um, there's something called corquettes, which is basically zucchini. And I then, think that's an English term. I think so, yeah. too. Yeah. Um, corzette. Yeah. Yeah, corzette. And so it's the squash plants, um, even watermelon. But most of the time people see it on their squash. It is possible to see it on your cucumbers or yeah. beans, too. But typically it's like those... Some grasses and flowers. Some grasses and flowers, yep. Yeah. So once we identify that we have powdery mildew, what is the cause of powdery mildew. So people typically get it near the end, or not the end of summer. Mid to late. Mid to late summer. So what happens is that we are, even though it's still quite warm out at that point, near your end of summer, close to the end of summer, um, mid to late summer, but we're moving towards fall. We're moving towards shorter days and cooler nights. So what happens is that we still get that heat during the day. We still get that humidity during the day. But then we get those cooler nights and we have longer nights. So we have, we're moving towards our our winter solstice, our fall equinox. And so our days are just getting shorter. You're not, you're not noticing it, but your plants can notice it. So what happens is that we may have these plants in the sun in July where they're going to dry out after the summer solstice. But as we move toward, as the earth moves towards what's known as the fall is when these nights get shorter or longer days get shorter so it's because of hum- high humidity in the air cooler nights and less less daylight essentially. so the humidity acquires onto the leaf structure and is unable to dry out by and the time night falls just like in a bathroom if it's not ventilated or there's not good cir- air circulation mildew will begin to form on surfaces same thing applies in the garden on these plants. That's correct, and that's where the issue comes from. So it's because of because of too much You water. may not physically see, oh, there's water droplets on my zucchini plant or bean or cucumber, but there is that microscopic layer of moisture that is able to start to develop this mildew once the night falls, and it cannot dry out properly like it would late earlier in the year when the nighttime temperatures are very warm and the days are very long. That's correct. So that's what's causing it. Um, so and, and it can be detrimental if not treated because, as we spoke about moments ago, it will suffocate the plant out. So, so the biggest thing is is that, one, is that if you crowd your plants... So this a lot of this goes back to when you, when you start your plants, and this is good to keep in mind for next year. You can look for disease-resistant varieties. Your local uh, university extension would have a list of that. If you are just like, I'm going to plant whatever I like, that's okay, too. There are, there are varieties that mm-hmm. have been hybridized and some that or are heirloom that have been discovered that w- are resistant to powdery mildew. Right. And these, so that's another thing is you also want to water at the right time, time of day. So you want to make sure you're not, in this case, you'd want to water during the morning if you can because if you water at night you're going to have your plants wet you're going to increase the chance of mildew well watering it really goes back to last week's conversation how is the water applied to the garden well, that's above it. or at root zone if you're applying at root zone you shouldn't have to worry right, about it exactly um so you don't want to crowd your plants it's good and then you want to give your plants enough sunlight all of these plants are full sun plants so you want to make sure that you're providing them full sun especially if, if powdery mildew is an issue for you year after year maybe you didn't know what it was and now you know what it is and you constantly get it then you want to make sure that you are planting them so that they receive enough sunlight so they can dry off. If you do not if you do not have enough sunlight in the area in which you're trying to grow, put something in that area in which can survive and thrive in partial shade and spend your three dollars and save your frustration, go to the farmer's market and buy the produce in which you're unable to grow because of the lack of sunlight in your uh, growing environment or or backyard. Right. You want to avoid or over fertilization and that is you want to avoid over-fertilization for many reasons. Um, we're going to focus the reason on <laughs> the powdery mildew today. But, yeah, it, it has economic it can, or uh, uh, environmental impacts of over-fertilization. Well, right, and it just, it just boosts your plant too much. Your plant then is going to grow essentially too fast. and that it's, it's jacked up on energy yeah. drink essentially all the time with too much fertilization. So that's why you want to avoid over-fertilization with these plants because if they start growing these leaf structures too large, too fast then you're going to increase your problems. So there's a few things you can do for for powdery mildew. The biggest one is to, um, it, once you have it, not saying to avoid it, not to prevent it, but once you have it. Once you have it, if you have it only on a certain few leaves, let's p- pick zucchini here because that's easy description. Uh, uh, if you have 27 leaves on your zucchini plant and four of them are infected, 
you can remove those four leaves, cut that stalk down at the junction of the base of the, of the plant, and get rid of them and throw them in the trash. Be careful as how you remove those, transport those da uh, infected leaves to the destination of the trash can because those spores, if you're just dangling across the garden, those spores can fall on adjacent plants and begin the in, uh, infecting those plants as well. Those spores can stain your hands, your gloves, when you touch other plants. Right, and you can remove up to 25% of your plant. So It may seem shocking and detrimental. <laughs> It's fine. It's okay. Your because plant will the, be okay. Yeah, the plant's going to go into a, a, a non-recovery or survival meth, uh, mechanism, but just a growing because it's got rid of those infected parts of the plant. Right. So, yeah, you can remove the up to 25% of the leaf structure. If it is just one plant and you have lots of those plants planted, just yank the plants out if there's a, if it's... But that's typically not the case, but you can do that. All right. So you can use baking soda to help to help clear off this what it does is it breaks up that powdery mildew and this seems to be the most effective way now it's not just sprinkle powder uh, baking no, soda so you have to, what you're going to do okay. is you're going to mix one tablespoon of baking soda with a teaspoon of some sort of garden oil so you can use neem oil um and then you would do uh one teaspoon of soap but when we say soap we mean something like not a detergent soap so something like dish soap or dr bronner's okay um because of the compounds in which the soap is made from, it affects how it, it bonds to the plant. Right. That soap is the bonding agent which holds the baking soda to the plant to allow the breakup of the mildew to occur. Definitely. Okay. So that's what you want to do, and then you mix that with a gallon of water. You spray on your plants every but, whoa, one Well, water weeks. is what's causing the problem here. But you need, you need, uh, you need a vehicle to get the, this onto the plant. Okay. So if you do this, you probably want to do this sometime like in the morning if you can because that way it'll help evaporate. So you do that every one to two weeks. You want to spray your leaves thoroughly. Um, this is the most recommended. This is the safest for your tree to remove this. You're not going to mess up any new growth that's possible um, that's growing. Like you don't have to be as careful. You just want to make sure you are coating the plants and that you're being, being smart and uh, vigilant and the it. baking soda disrupts the pH balance of that mildew. Is the chemistry that goes is going yeah. on 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 a microscopic level? What right. other ways in which we can utilize uh, home uh, products to do that? Uh, so you could use mouthwash or vinegar. And mouthwash, like just go to the dollar store and get yourself a bottle of mouthwash. You don't need to use the any high sort of alcohol volume uh, mouthwash. The cheap, the, the cheap, uh, stuff the old cheaper stuff you bought on but sale with the alcohol. In. Okay, you want the acid. Same thing with vinegar. You want to use like an apple cider vinegar, not like white vinegar. But when you do this, this part, using that. You, if you spray new foliage, you're going to have problems. So that's why the baking soda is recommended, because if you spray your new foliage it's with neutral. that, it's neutral. Okay. So this is acidic. So if you're using mouthwash or vinegar, just be aware. Do not spray that new foliage. Um, but it's two tablespoons per gallon of water. Spray the plants every one to two weeks. And you can find these recipes online. What is it, growingagreenerworld.com. Uh, powdery mildew. P powdery mildew mm -hmm. is, is where you can find Joe Lamp, a host of uh, the PBS program, who's been a guest on this pro on our show several times, has a great article and breaks it down to the, the recipes of all of these and, and what he finds works best and ones to avoid. Uh, in in the garden, so you also want you can use milk, which nobody really exactly knows why it worked for us, but it, that's what and this is what Joe Lamp also said. But something about the naturally occurring compounds in milk, they will combat the disease in regular boost. milk, not no. lactase free milk. The regular milk that you get at the store, right? Yeah, okay. Um, and if you don't drink milk, that if you don't drink dairy milk, do, just do the go powdery or do the no. uh, the baking soda. Yeah, do the baking, yeah, baking soda, soda, or just maybe you want to try milk and just go get yourself. Half gallon of milk. Um, so you're going to do one part milk to two parts water. This would be a weekly dose as well. It just helps boost the plant's immune system. So you don't want to overdo it, but you definitely want to, to do something. So there is just some of the ways in which you can deal with the powdery mildew that many of us will face in our garden. It's the white substance that begins to occur on the plants later on in the year. But when we come back, we're going to talk about cold frames, what they are, what the benefits they are, and how you can build your own to extend your growing season. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show.
24-7-365. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com has all the gardening information you need. Videos, digital magazines, replays of shows, and more. Spending time scrubbing pesky dirt off your hands after gardening? Use Workman's Friends Superior Skin Cream with added barrier protection, creating a protective layer on your skin surface, allowing for easy cleanup, all while moisturizing and healing your skin. Non-greasy, fragrant-free, and fast-absorbing. Apply first, get to work, wipe clean. This friend has you covered for whatever you're getting into. Visit WorkmansFriendBrand.com. Beans and Barley Market and Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side and greater Milwaukee area, where you can find all you need. From fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh squeezed carrot juice, a health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cards, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available. Open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414-278-7878, and online at beansandbarley.com. Do you want fresh produce delivered right to your neighborhood? Check out Tree Ripe Citrus Company. Find out where to pick up quality produce at tree-ripe.com. They have beautiful tasty peaches and juicy sweet blueberries. If you're tired of the non-taste peaches and the bad blueberries from your local grocer, Tree Ripe has what you need. They come right to a stop in your neighborhood, fresh off the truck, right from the source. To find locations and schedules, visit tree-ripe.com. They're in Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, and right here in Wisconsin. Tree-Ripe.com is your go-to place for the freshest produce around. The Handy Safety Knife is a patented high-quality knife that's worn like a ring, so it's always conveniently at hand and very easy and efficient to work with. That's why you'll find the Handy Safety Knife at work in a wide range of industries and applications. Learn more at HandySafetyKnife.com. Use coupon code WVG to get 10% off and free shipping one time use only at HandySafetyKnife.com. If you stop, they'll stop. This garden tip is sponsored by BioSafe. Organic solutions that are effective. They offer an array of eco-friendly products. From plant food to fertilizer to one-of-a-kind herbicides, organic weed killer. Grow stronger, healthier with BioSafe. Visit BioSafe.net to learn more. And save 10% on your next order by using coupon code TWVG at checkout. Keep harvesting your fruit and vegetables when they are ripe. Leaving the crop unharvested on the vine will signal to the plant to stop growing and simply work on production of seeds internally. If you stop picking, they'll stop producing. Do you seek safe, effective nutrition solutions to boost your health and quality of life? Standard Process is your trusted whole food supplement manufacturer with 90 years of expertise. Our third generation family owned company proudly grows nutrient rich ingredients at our certified organic farm in Palmyra, Wisconsin, enabling us to produce high quality whole food solutions that change lives. For help identifying the best supplements for you, find a local healthcare professional today at standardprocess.com forward slash patients. Take the pain out of planting with the Pro Plugger 5 in 1 planting tool. Step, twist, pull, and you're ready to plant. Digs perfect size planting holes. Soil gets stored in the tube and empties from the top. Helpful for weeding. ProPlugger.com. When it comes to bulk landscaping materials, Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is where everyone goes. Whatever the project, we have the materials you need with over 40 varieties to choose from. Soils, mulches, gravels, decorative stones, fresh cut sod. Blue Mills has these products in stock and ready for easy pickup or fast delivery. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to get your yard back into shape. Stop in and pick these materials up or call us for delivery today. Nobody does bulk landscaping materials better than Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Ivy Organics, Power Planter, Root Assassin, Beans and Barley, BioSafe, Bob X, Pomona Universal Pectin, Pro Plugger, Standard Process, Tomato Snaps. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Dr. Ed has committed to clean and healthy gardening. 
through creating cutting edge natural and organic friendly products. Based on research and innovation, after 28 years, they are the leader in the organic lawn and garden industry. They do not use ingredients such as biosolids or composted household waste or synthetic chemicals. Instead, they have manure free fertilizers, organic soils, insect control, and liquid fertilizers. If you want to grow the best quality food organically to feed your family, that is the founding principles of what Dr. Earth is all about. They have experts to find the most innovative ways to help you grow your best organically. Visit DrEarth.com for more information on where to buy. When most people are, I'll, I'll take that back, there is a group of individuals in the gardening world that feel that gardening happens here in the upper Midwest, Memorial Day to Labor Day, and the season's done. But whenever, there, and then the rest, and there's other ones who try to get the most out of their garden all season long, plant very early, plant very late, try to utilize those seasons of the cool weather crops. And then there's those people who extend it even further. That build or purchase cold frames in order to maximize the time in which they can grow plants outdoors. Mm -hmm. Now, what is a cold frame, first of all, for those who are unfamiliar with that particular term of the gardening uh, so it's not it's not world. a greenhouse. It's kind of like a mini greenhouse. It's a frame, a framed area encapsulated where you can put it over your ground. You're not you're not growing in it. You're putting it over the ground. Well, you're growing in it, but it's not like a, a raised bed with a f- cover over it. You're putting it over the ground typically. Okay. Or if it is a raised bed, you would raise the sides up higher to put this cold frame. A so box with a lid. A box with a lid essentially is what it okay. is. Yeah. But a lot of people think it's a raised bed, and then you're you're putting a lid over it. That's not the, the case. It's a box of the lid. You can accustom, or you can customize a raised bed by putting hinges and putting a lid on top of it. But if you're going to construct a raised bed, or, or, or a cold frame, that is, there's many materials in which we can do it. And a cold frame can be a variety of different sizes. We want to keep in mind, what are we growing in it? How tall does the plants in which we were growing in it get? And how much space do we need? Because... In the cooler time of the year, let's say you have a cold frame that you've made out of 2 by 8 or 2 by 12 lumber. If it's 20 foot long by 5 foot wide, there's a lot of airspace and it's got a lid. And we'll talk about the, the, the opaque material which we put on top of that to allow sunlight to come through to allow the plants to continue to grow. We're not growing these in a box with uh, no sunlight. Uh, how much? That's a lot of airspace, a 5 foot by 20 foot by 12 inch high box contains a lot of airspace, and in the cooler times of the year, that is, uh, air gets very cold, even though it is inside of a, essentially a, a box that you're trying to keep warm enough to sustain life on these cool weather plants. Mm-hmm. So you'd want to keep it like four by eight, four by four, something smaller. Okay, first of all, we're growing in these pla- we're in these, in these cold frames, and we'll talk about materials and the types of items in which we can build them with. We're growing cool weather crops, and we're starting them early in the midsummer. They're not physically growing in November. No, you can and de- start them in... September. Okay, but they're not mm-hmm. physically growing in November, December, January. No, you're not going to. So what you're going to do is, first of all, you need to build a cold frame or obtain a cold frame. So okay. let's get to that. Okay. So you can use wood. We, we built ours out of old wood and a window. Um, you can use wood. You can use, you can use straw bales. If you use straw bales, you might have to take and insulate it a little bit more, the straw. Um, because it kinda, doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't meet like wood does. Yeah. Um, so you use that, and there's lots of tutorials on YouTube about building cold frames, all about cold frames. So definitely, you know, check that out. Don't just watch one and go, I got it. Watch about a dozen because there's a lot of information, good and bad. Mm-hmm. And people will say, hey, I did this and it didn't work, or hey, I did this and it was the best thing, ever, you know, that type of thing. So Right. So you want you can find lots of information. If you don't have an old window and you want you want to make a window, you would use the, it's a poly plastic drop cloth that you can get from your local home store three mil um, or six mil no i'm not talking like home decor store i'm talking like home big box store big box store yeah like home repair in store. the paint center paint mm-hmm. department yeah so and that's pretty that's pretty cheap to buy it's not expensive at all so you would build your cold frame sometimes you can maybe find used ones whatever so you want to make sure you have doing that now some people will pl- paint their cold frames black because during the day it absorbs that heat from the sun and then it releases it into the cold frame at night if you don't want to do that you don't have to paint the outer portions, not the uh, that, not the plastic or the window. No, on the yeah, top. like those sides. Or okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's how you, that's what a cold frame is. That's how you make a cold frame. That's 
that's how you... There's no real wrong way to do a cold frame, but there is guidelines in which allows you to have the best success in growing that cold frame that you're constructing. And also, if you're concerned about it not being warm enough, you could also take, some people will do this, they'll take um, soda bottles or milk cartons or milk jugs or whatever, paint those black, and then put those... Fill them with water. Fill them with water, and then that way it'll be the same effect. Yeah, during the day it absorbs the heat of the sun in that uh, item, and at night it releases that warmth back into the cold frame. Now, we're talking cold frames, there are, call, there are other things called low tunnels, that's Kind of the same thing, uh, but we're going to focus on the building and the construction and the materials for the cold frame and not necessarily the low tunnel. So, yeah, right. So mm-hmm. if you if you want to do this now, get started, definitely. Go around on junk day. You can pretty much <laughs> find what you need. True story. True story. Yep. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's what you want to, this is something you want to keep in mind. So then come like mid-September, you want to get these plants established. So if you're growing root crops or greens, that's typically what's going to be grown in the cold frame, so you can harvest them year-round is the root crops and greens. So things like carrots, beets, radishes, um, and then any sort of green kale, collards. Um, the radish is 30 days pretty quick. To, charred. To, yeah. Right. So the radishes, you might have... You, you can wait a little bit longer, but yeah. So now, what you want to do is you want to you want to get these plants established so that when it starts to get colder out, you can harvest. You can have that continual harvest. And if you're growing, if you've started kale, kale can get two, three foot tall. Now, obviously, you're not going to. Most people will not construct a cold frame that's three foot tall in order to accommodate the height you of make that a particular multi-level cold uh, frame. Right. Yeah. Uh, but don't you, do that. But you can get it. You know, at twelve or even eighteen inches high and create a nice little environment in there for that plant. And as you're harvesting, Swiss chard is another one, as they get to touching that plastic or that window at the top, you can harvest those particular leaves and then allow that plant to regenerate or sustain the the structure of leaves that it currently has on it. Again, November, December, January, if you're fortunate enough to do this and get them to grow through that particular time, they're not going to put on new leaf structure every week because inside of that cold frame, it may be four degrees outside, that cold frame may be 32 or 33 degrees. So we're sustaining life. We're not making, we're, the plants are not growing. Uh, a great book in which uh, you can follow a lot and get a lot of good information is Nikki Jabor's uh, The Year Round Vegetable Garden. She's in Nova Scotia, Canada. She does this year round every year, grows a tremendous amount of produce over the winter months. Uh, inside cold frames and has been doing this for a decade with no problem whatsoever. Right. And Nova Scotia is a cold place. It is a cold place. They have not. They have less of a growing season than we do here in the upper Midwest. So, so what else do we need to know about uh, cold frames here? So you can grow these hardy vegetables. So that's what that's what's cool. Now, say you say you don't want to attempt this. Say you have a yard and you're like, I don't want to mess with my yard during winter. I just want to have winter and be winter. Okay. What you can do is you can still build this cold frame and you can put it in one spot in your yard and then when it's springtime it's going to start to warm up the soil faster also you could build it and then put your cooler weather crop plants start them in seeds start them from seed in trays root maker trays and pl- start putting them in that cold frame and essentially you've got a mini greenhouse that you don't have to utilize a grow light or the space indoors now you have to be careful what ones you put out there, but your your broccoli, your cauliflower, your kale, your collard greens. You Those are pretty hardy. Very hardy. Mm-hmm. Start them out there, and then as that warms, then the seed will germinate, and then you can uh, harden. So you them can kind of have yeah. an additional grow uh, seed starting space. So that's another advantage to the cold frame. It it works very very well if you go that route, and again you can start your cooler weather crops direct seed sowing, carrots and radishes and other parsnips. Uh, in the ground there in the spring, too. Another thing to keep in mind is you may have to vent it during the day. I um, mean, on the upper Midwest, we'll get, this in December, it'll get up to 45, 50 a lot. You're going to have to vent that because otherwise you're going to bake your plants. Come January, maybe not so much, but then as we get an occasional warm day here or there, you're going to have to vent it. You have to keep in mind that, that it's basically like your plants are in a tent. Right. Essentially, and they could kind of suffocate if it's too hot. It's 40 degrees ambient temperature, but inside of that closed uh, area, it's 70, 80, 90 degrees because the radiation of the sun has warmed that air, and there's no way of escaping. So you want to keep that in mind as well. Well, 
uh, Holly, it is summertime, and we have visitors in the garden, and those are those nasty Japanese beetles, and they are wreaking havoc on our plants, our rose bushes, our bowl, or pole beans, and all of our vegetation. If you're looking to successfully control beetles without damaging the environment, look no further than Beetle Gone from Phylum Bioproducts. Derived from a naturally occurring soil bacteria, Beetle Gone is the only organic solution that successfully controls beetle invaders. Uh, just mix the powder and water and spray in your plants. Once ingested, these tar- targeted pests will stop feeding and die. And since it's an organic BT product, you know it's a great choice to use on your fruit and veggies in addition to your ornamental flowers and trees. Not only is Beetle Gone does it work, but the good thing about this product, it is safe to use around your beneficial insects such as ladybugs, butterflies, and bees and has no issue with water toxicity. Beetle Gone from Phylum Bioproducts dot com. Phylum Bioproducts dot com. P-H-Y-L-L-O-M-B-I-O Products dot com. Get $10 off for limited time when using coupon code 10 off T-E-N-O-F-F. Jessica Walliser up next. question email the show at twvgshow at gmail.com power planter is a family-owned earth auger manufacturer the power planter earth auger will transform your garden experience it helps homeowners and professionals complete almost any planting or digging project faster and more efficiently than using a shovel or a spade Power Planter Earth Auger creates loose dirt when drilling holes, giving your plants better root-to-soil contact to help reduce plant loss for healthier, and more beautiful trees, shrubs, flowers, vegetables, and grass. All of our augers are hand-welded and made in the USA lifetime warranty. Find the size that fits your project at powerplanter.com. Flame Engineering, home of the Weed Dragon, the perfect propane torch kit for home and garden use. For killing weeds, no need to pull or spray. 100 other uses. Find out more at flameengineering.com. Use coupon code WVG19 to get free shipping. Root Assassin, a garden tool that does all the root functions with its advanced shovel that has serrated edges on both sides. Find out more information at rootassassinshovel.com. The Norwalk Juicer is the best cold-pressed juicer on the market. Studies have shown the Norwalk Juicer produces 50 to 100% more juice than other juicers. And juice from the Norwalk is higher in minerals and nutritionally superior. Not only do you get more juice from your produce, but also better quality juice. Check it out at norwalkjuicers.com. Use coupon code GARDENTALK to get free continental U.S. shipping on the Model 290 Juicer. Pomona's Universal Pectin is high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar, honey, or any alternative sweetener you'd like. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Available at most natural food stores and online. Never question your garden soil again. Know what's in your soil with confidence. Professional grade soil test for the home gardener. My Soil Savvy has the easiest soil test on the market. Ship it to them, get your report, emailed with nutrients recommendation, and grow happy, healthy plants. MySoilSavvy.com. Use coupon code TWVG19 and save 10% at checkout. Shield and Seal Vacuum Sealers and the highest quality vacuum sealing products, unique black and clear and all black bags protecting your produce and product better than traditional bags. Find out more at shieldandseal.com. The bottom of your tomato is black and sunken in. You've got blossom and root rot and here's how you fix it. This Michigan Garden Moment is brought to you by MIGardener.com. With over 450 varieties of heirloom and organic flowers, vegetables, and herb seeds, all for 99 cents a pack. Find out more at MIGardener.com. So you have a tomato that's ready to harvest. You pick it, and it's black and rotten on the bottom. And when you cut into it, it goes all the way through the fruit. This is blossom and root rot. It's not a disease necessarily. It is a deficiency. It is a lack of calcium that has been not able to be picked up by the plant in order to fully develop the fruit correctly. This occurs when the soil is too dry. You may have plenty of calcium in your soil or more than you ever need, but if the soil is too dry, the plant cannot access that calcium. It's locked out until it rains or you water. 
then the calcium that is available in the soil is able to uptake into the plant to fully develop the fruit correctly. People often say use Epsom salt, two tablespoons to one gallon, water the plant and it will fix the problem. It fixes the problem because you're watering the plant and releasing and unlocking the calcium that is in the soil. Epsom salt, magnesium sulfate, does help for bigger blooms and greener plants, but calcium is not magnesium sulfate. By doing this, you will fix the problem on the next generation of fruit. It will not fix the fruit that is developing that is deficient of calcium and have the blackness on the bottom. Remove those fruits right now so the plant can focus on the healthy production of the next generation. Keep the soil damp like a sponge, not soggy, and you'll prevent this problem from happening for the rest of the year. This Michigan Garden Moment is brought to you by MIGardener.com. With over 450 varieties of heirloom and organic flowers, vegetables, and herb seeds, all for 99 cents a pack. Find out more at MIGardener.com. Aphids, a bad bug for your garden. It's time for this week's Garden Fun Fact. Honeydew is a sugary byproduct extracted by aphids. Ants like this as it is rich in carbohydrates. Some ants live with aphids in a mutual beneficial relationship. The ants protect the aphids and the aphids give the ants honeydew. Some ants have even been known to stroke the aphids with their antennas to produce more honeydew. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Clyde's Vegetable Planting Chart. Dharmaceutical, Dr. Earth, Flame Engineering, Handy Safety Knife, Hydro Box, Wisconsin Greenhouse Company, MI Gardener, Outpost Natural Food Co-op, Root Maker, Soil Diva, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center is having their second annual Blue Mills Summer Market. Four dates. August 24th through September the 14th, each Saturday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. They'll have over 40 different vendors of crafts, produce, food. They'll also have music there. And Holly and I will be there as well on a couple of those Saturdays. And you can find all of that out and more at BlueMills.com. And their location is 4930 West Loomis Road, just south of Layton in Greenfield. You can call 414-282-4220 or you can go to BlueMills.com. We were there last year. It's a really great activity for you, the family. Come out and see us, as well as what they have to offer. This is horticulturist Jessica Walliser from SavvyGardening.com and KDKA Radio in Pittsburgh. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Holly, let's go to the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline and bring in Jessica Walliser. Jessica Walliser is an author, gardener, radio show host. Uh, she's the host of the Organic Gardener on KDKA, or the co-host, in Pittsburgh. She's a blogger, columnist, and all-around horticultural and botanical enthusiast. She lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Welcome to the program, Jessica. Thanks, Holly. Hi, Joey. How are you guys? We are doing well. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on the program and enlighten Holly and myself and all of our listeners. It is my pleasure. I'm always happy to join you guys. We always have a good time. Absolutely. Uh, So let's start with this. We've had a tremendous issue with weeds in our garden. I've spent time weeding prior to planting, and it seems like I have just encouraged the weeds to come with a garden fork and removing the roots. That haven't seemed to work very well. How do you deal with weeds, and what is the best method that you have found to uh, get them out and keep them out? Ah, excellent question. Well, I suppose in a, in a lot of ways it depends on the type of weed that you're dealing with. Um, certainly annual weeds. Uh, here, my biggest problem is Pennsylvania smartweed, uh, which is actually easy to pull out. It's just a pain because it reseeds everywhere. So with annual weeds, it's super important that you never let them go to seed. So even if you have a big weed issue and you can't get to hand pulling them, at least you know weed whack them or mow them down so that they don't set seed and make more problems for you the following year. If you're talking about perennial weeds like Canada thistle or really horrible ones like bindweed, um, I always like to do the barrier method. So in my vegetable garden in areas where that's a problematic um, you know, situation, before I plant, I'll put down 10 sheets thick of newspaper and then uh, I will cover that with 
uh, usually shredded leaves or straw, and then I'll plant right down through it. So I'll like cut an X in the newspaper and p plant down through it and leave it in place the entire season. And that really sort of forms like a physical barrier to keep those weeds from coming up through it. And that works best for me. That's a that's a really good, definitely really good tip. And people will often say, oh, I'll just use the glyphosate and that'll kill them. But the problem that the glyphosate has, it stays in the soil and makes the soil extremely toxic for what you're trying to plant. These are not genetically modified crops. So that's what people often say. Now, for people growing in small spaces such as urban gardening, especially vegetables, what is some advice you can give for one that is new to gardening in those small spaces? Yeah, so, you know, if you're gardening in a small space, you know, or a large space, it doesn't matter. If you're new to it, you want to start small. So don't go out and put in a giant vegetable garden or install 10 raised beds or something like that. Start with one raised bed or start with a few containers on a sunny patio or deck. And really just sort of dip your toes into the experience of vegetable gardening. And then once you have a little bit of success, then you can gradually increase the space. Um, the other bit of advice I would give is don't get ex you know discouraged because not everybody, I mean, even longtime gardeners, we fail at things sometimes, right? We, we you know, I, I'm growing this great little container watermelon called Sugar Pot, and I've grown it three years in a row. And two of the three years, you know, I've had success, and then the other year, it didn't work out so well. So, you know, there's going to be times that things don't work the way you want them to, but don't let that stop you from continuing to, tr to try again. And certainly for small space gardeners, varietal selection means everything, because if you're just growing in a small area, a little raised bed or a little pot, you don't want to grow a tomato that's going to grow eight feet tall. You want to get a, grow a tomato that's going to grow 18 inches to 24 inches tall. So choose your varieties really carefully. Well, you speak about failure, and you stand next to a guy each Sunday morning on KDK Radio who uh, has grown for many, many years and has never able has not able to grow garlic, uh, at least the last time I, we spoke to him. Has he been able to achieve that accomplishment yet? If you're talking about Doug, he's yes. an excellent garlic grower, but what he can't grow for the life of him are onions. Onions, that's what it is. <laughs> onions. And I keep telling him, I said, Doug, you know, you need to test the pH of your soil because I'll bet you the pH is too acidic, which, you know, inhibits the absorption of phosphorus and the availability of phosphorus in the soil. And as you and I know, bulb crops like that, root crops, love phosphorus. And doesn't matter how much you add if the ph of the soil isn't right the plants can't access it so i keep telling him but he won't listen to me he never listens to me <laughs> what are you going to do well and, and uh shauna cornada you, you talked about uh, you know plants dying shauna cornada she's been on the program and she has quoted that you have to kill at least a thousand plants before you're considered at least a, a decent gardener so I think we're all, I, I love that. <laughs> all qualified in that realm somewhere, somewhere or another. Uh, one is, uh, many people do not realize you can grow fruit in small spaces. Uh, and you've got several great books that illustrate this. What are some great fruits to grow in containers and why do they work so well? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the main reasons why I wrote my most recent book, which is Gardener's Guide to Compact Plants. And that's because there's all of these amazing compact fruit, vegetables, shrubs, uh, you know, perennials that stay small and compact. They're out there on the market, but so many gardeners don't know about them. So, for example, if you're looking to grow compact fruits, I would recommend the um, dwarf raspberries and blackberries as a good place to start. Um, there's a, a dwarf raspberry called raspberry shortcake that gets only about two feet tall. Uh, I have a raised bed, of a four by eight raised bed of them in my backyard, and they're fantastic. They don't take over the space. They stay really small. You can grow them in a pot. Um, there's also certainly dwarf blueberries like uh, jelly bean and top hat and blueberry glaze and those guys stay small they're self-fertile so you only need one plant not two you know you don't need a cross pollinator um, strawberries are always a great idea for small spaces and then there's the fruit trees there are now some super dwarf fruit trees that are not grafted. So you don't have to still prune them to keep them small. They're a genetic dwarf. And my favorite is a peach called Pixze, P-I-X-Z-E-E. -E, and it gets only five feet tall, 
and a spread of about four feet or so. And it's beautiful in like a 50 gallon pot or 35 gallon pot on the patio and it produces full size peaches. It's amazing. So when, when you talk about these dwarf plants, now these are hibernized or are these heirloom or a combination that we're finding these uh, and we're not hibernizing these? It depends. It okay. depends on the particular variety that you're you're talking about. Um, some of them are hybrid. Some, in the case of Pixie, it's a genetic dwarf. So it happened by a chance mutation, and somebody's I don't know the true story of it, the background of it, but usually what happens is you have a true genetic dwarf like that in a in a sampling of plants grown, and one just happens to have that trait, and then that from there it's vegetatively propagated, so that that trait is then in all of the off offspring. They're they're cloned. They're taking like a cutting right. of it, right? Vegetatively propagated. So they're not grafted onto a dwarfing rootstock. Instead, that's actually the true genetics of the plant, which is extra cool because you don't have to worry about protecting a graft union or or you know the rootstock sprouting or something like that it's just what nature did and and we're able to continue on that benefit that it's provided for us exactly exactly right. and there's a nectarine too that's a true genetic dwarf it's called necta z um, necta z e e and also another true genetic dwarf really cool okay so when we talk about small space gardening many people think of urban settings maybe um people who live in a city where they have a small yard or they live they have a balcony or a patio or something that they want to grow on but maybe there's people out there who have a huge yard but they they don't want to grow on that huge yard what are the advantages to small space gardening as opposed to if you if you do have a lot of space available what are some advantages that are applicable to just about anybody yeah, Holly, that's a great question because, you know, I have two acres here, but I grow lots of these compact plants that I talk about in Gardener's Guide to Compact Plants. And one of the biggest reasons for me, especially when it comes to the trees and shrubs, is it's like it's no pruning required, right? So you don't have to go out every spring and, you know, prune your viburnums or your lilacs or your rhododendrons as soon as they're done blooming in order to keep them small and compact so that they fit in your foundation planting. Instead, we're looking at varieties of these plants that stay naturally compact um, and fit beautifully in those spaces. So it's really all about the reduction in maintenance. And same thing with the, some of the compact perennials. You know, maybe you have a space around a pool or around your patio or deck and you don't want to interfere with your sight line or you don't want to have to go out and stake and support those plants because they get so floppy. So if you grow a more compact variety, you're eliminating that maintenance task as well. And just because you grow in a small space with a compact variety does not mean that that plant's not going to produce. A lot of these are very prolific producers, and you can still get quite a bit out of that very small space. Absolutely. And, you know, in the case of a lot of the perennials, their sort of uh, cultural habits are the same as their full-grown cousins, right? So the varieties or, or other cultivars of that plant. So let's take Monarda or Bee Balm as an example. The compact varieties, they bloom just as long as the full-size varieties. If you, you know, cut them back after they bloom, they'll produce a, many times a second flush of blooms, just like the full-size one does. So you have all the bloom power or all the fruiting or vegetable production out of the plant, but it's just in a neater, tidier package. So your new book, The Gardener's Guide to Compact Plants, we... Uh, just like your other books, phenomenal publication, great pictures, great information, and we always know when you got a new book coming out because the mailman delivers it to our home, which is really cool. <laughs> uh, but can you tell us more about what's in the book and what our listeners can expect when they open the book up to learn about growing in small spaces and compact areas with compact yeah, plants? Absolutely. A lot of it is sort of an extension of what the great questions were that you guys asked me today. You know, I, I talk about selecting and maintaining compact plants, you know, what the difference is between, um, you know, these varieties and full size varieties. I also talk about where they come from, you know, how are they bred? How are they selected? Why do we look for these traits? And where can you buy them, right? Where do you find them on the market? There's a resource section in the back of the book that will help you with that. Um, I also have a section on using compact plants to solve problems. Like, what do you do if you have a slope in your garden or you have a lot of shade or you want to, you know, you have a neighbor who, you know, has junk in their yard and you want to block that view. So what kind of compact plants do you use for privacy screening? 
Um, and then the whole back part of the book is profiles of specific trees, shrubs, perennials, fruits and vegetables and herbs that are varieties that are small in stature that are perfect for gardeners who either want reduced maintenance or they want to grow in a smaller space. That's definitely, um, yeah, I, I think for a lot of our listeners, it's very applicable to them. So how can we find out more about you? Um, obviously, you're a radio show host, but you're an author. Uh, where can people get all of your great information? So I would recommend they go to one of my two websites. And the first is a more informational gardening resource website, which is Savvy Gardening, S-A-V-V-Y Gardening.com. Uh, and if they want to know specifically about me, my lectures and classes and things like that, they can go to my personal website, which is jessicawalliser.com. Well, Jessica, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us on the program and, and sharing a lot of your knowledge uh, with us and our listeners. Oh, it's always so much fun to join you guys. I love watching your YouTube videos and, and getting to know you better, too. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much thank for you, that. Jessica. And when we come back, it's going to be all about your garden questions and our garden answers. You can always submit a question via email at twvgshow at gmail.com. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Send your questions in now to the IV Organics 3-in-1 Plant Garden Instant Access text hotline at 414-368-9311. That number again, text 414-368-9311 and send your garden question in. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at migardener.com. Now with over 450 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom, and organic flower, vegetable, and herb seeds available year-round, pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to migardener.com for seeds and garden needs, tools, and special blend fertilizers. migardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Here at Outpost Natural Foods, it's not just that we're community-owned that sets us apart. It's the fabulous foods we sell. We celebrate Earth Day every day by offering our customers the finest natural and organic food selections in greater Milwaukee. Outpost local farmers and vendors provide our stores with a delicious selection of fresh seasonal produce that you won't want to miss. Outpost stores are located in Milwaukee, Wauwatosa, Bayview, and Mequon. We're a real Milwaukee original where anyone can shop and anyone can join. For the whole scoop about Outpost, we invite you to visit www.outpost.coop. Thermaceuticals essential oils are high grade, very pure, and high in quality. They have synergized blends made with the finest raw materials. For more information and to order, visit Dharmaceuticals.com. The new way to support your tomatoes, wrap it and snap it. Tomatosnaps.com. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. BobX is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. BobX deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. BobX can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more? Visit BobX.com. B-O-B-B. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mel's also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mel's today. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Eco Garden Systems, Rowmaker, Shield and Seal, World's Coolest Rain Gauge, Big Fats Hot Sauce, Chapin International, Drip Garden, Norwalk Juicers, New New Healing Ointment, Phylum Bioproducts, Soil Savvy, Tree Ripe. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, your home for Garden Talk Radio with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. 
Do you have a question? You can get a hold of us on the Ivy Organics Communication Hotline. Communication Hotline. Ivy Organics 301 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents. Protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces. For use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. You can send us an email through the Ivy Organics 301 Plant email inbox. That email address is twvgshow at gmail.com. Or you can text us on the 31 Plant Guard Instant Access Text Hotline with your question at 414-368-9311. That number, again, is 414-368-9311. We had a couple of questions. Yes, we had questions here. Uh, In regards to uh, canning, uh, what temperature should the water be when I'm putting the water in the jars uh, that contain the beans before I put it in the the water bath canner? Well, first of all, you shouldn't water bath can beans, uh, uh, green beans. That should be a pressure canned. Uh, deal uh, because the bottom of the jars continue to break. Okay, so what you want to do is when you're can when you are canning any item, you want to use hot jars, hot food, hot liquid, hot whatever, into your hot jars into the hot canner. You, she's pickling these green beans, so that's okay, okay in yep, the water bath. Yep, mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, next question: I have <clears throat> issues with my beet leaves, and uh, they're turning purple. If you could let me know what it is and what I can do to fix that, that would be great. Thank you. So purpling leaves typically is a phosphorus deficiency, and so all plants need phosphorus. This helps um, grow the root and the fruit developments of your plants typically, uh, but it also lack of phosphorus is going to show purple leaves. As well as uh, purple stems and other, it, ha- it has different effects on different plant ve- uh, plant life, so that, that's a good starting point to figure out the deficiencies uh, in your soil. Uh, from Twitter, uh, we get a question, uh, long Twitter name, I'm just going to name it uh, James, uh, asks, love your show, listen every week, any truth to the myth of watering hot peppers to make them hotter? I, so, well, okay. Well, so thank, thank you for listening each and every week. We appreciate that. Okay, so the thing is, is that it's going to be the variety. You, you, whatever you plant is, is, um, yeah. It's, so a, it's, it's a variety, It's true. quite opposite. Wa- less water, less nitrogen, and then leaving them on the vine longer will intensify the heat. The, the capillaries in the, the mm-hmm. pepper. But yeah, it definitely uh, de- depends on the variety of pepper because some is very mild and others will take the paint off your car, uh, that type of heat intensity. Um, how is the best way to deal with, well, you know, when, you, you, when people are eating hot pepper uh, and the chef has to use rep- respirator and gloves and goggles to prepare it. Right. There's there's some heat to it. Uh, how can we deal with slugs in the garden? Okay, so you can introduce pet predators. You could attract things like garter snakes. Garter Don't scare snakes. them off. Or Yeah, yeah. garter snakes are predators to snails. Garter snakes are not harmful to you. Um, they're good. They're friends of the garden. Right, but if you see a snake, it's going to make you step back. You're not going to go over and try to pet it. But yeah, garter snakes uh, ha- are very beneficial to the garden. Uh, they work very well. You can also set traps out for uh, yeah, the sl- so this snails. Is like what you would do with slugs is you take a beer, um, some beer, and you you bury a little small any pan. specific kind of beer. Well, slugs seem to like IPAs. I don't know about snails. The, the hoppier type. <clears throat> yeah, they yeah. like the hoppier type. So. Um, what you do is you take your little pan, your little dish, and you bury it soil level, and then you put your beer in there, and they're going to be attracted to that. They're going to fall in, and then they're basically going to drown. Here's the thing. When we place the uh, beer in the container level, put it away from the issue so the slugs and the snails will go away to get drowned in the uh, beer. What is the best way to store Jerusalem artichokes over the winter? In the garage, is that okay, or in paper bags? Good question. We have a tremendous amount of artichokes as well. They're growing in our Jerusalem artichokes are a root crop that is less starchy than a potato, better for diabetics, but check with your local physician for that. The best way to store Jerusalem artichokes is to leave them in the ground, but obviously here in the upper Midwest, the ground freezes solid. So there's a couple of things in which we can do, and this applies for carrots and parsnips as well. You can take and cover the bed with leaves. Trim back the top growth and cover the bed with leaves with the Jerusalem artichoke. Three, four foot in depth. What that is doing is creating a refrigerator state in the soil, keeping it very cold, but preventing the soil from freezing. The second way in which you can store your Jerusalem artichokes is to take a bucket 
Put two inches of soil in the bottom, just out of the garden. Layer a, uh, a layer of Jerusalem artichokes. Put another two inches of soil, and all the way up to the top of the bucket. We take and store ours in an unclimatized stairway up to our attic. What you can also do is store that bucket in an unclimatized garage or shed, somewhere where it's not going to freeze solid, but it's going to be a very refrigerated state. And then you can hard, uh, dig them up out of the bucket when you want them. The other thing we have found that works somewhat decent is to harvest the Jerusalem artichokes and then take and put them in an airtight bag in the back of the fridge or in the crisper. That seems to keep relatively well, but not as long as the soil in the bucket in the stairwell of the attic. Tom in Milwaukee wants to know, is it safe to use the condensation water that comes off his air conditioner? Well, let's go to Ben Bartley. He is the farm property supervisor at Standard Process. Standard Process is your trusted whole food supplement manufacturer for over 90 years. To help identify the best supplements for you, find your local health care professional. Go to standardprocess.com forward slash patient. Hi, this is Ben Bartlett from the Standard Process Organic Farm. Today we have a question from Tom in Milwaukee who asks if it's safe to use the condensation water from his HVAC unit to water the garden. Actually, yes. The condensation is a great way to reutilize water that otherwise would go to waste. So the water is not run through the unit, so it doesn't pick up any chemicals, and it's still safe to use. Another way to collect and reuse water is to store the rainwater off your roof in barrels and then reuse it to water your garden in the dry season. A third way and really the easiest way is to build your gardens in a place, if possible, to take advantage of those downspouts and just have those gardens get irrigated every time it rains, which seems to be a lot this year. Good luck. Before we get into what's coming up next week on the program, Holly, remind them about the executive sponsor. The executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is Power Planter. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you. Create planting holes fast and efficiently with ease. No matter the soil type, it does the job effortlessly. Increase your root to soil contact. Leave the shovel and spade in the shed. Hand welded and made in the USA, we offer a lifetime warranty on product defects. Find the size that fits your project at powerplanter.com. Tune in next week on the program. We're going to talk about microbial life under the soil, as well as odd garden remedies that actually work. Our guest will be Ann Cotta Scott with Preserving the Harvest, plus your garden questions. Tell your friends and family to tune in. Do not miss the program. Miss any portion of this program or want to revisit it in its entirety, you can do that in a couple of different ways. One, by going to your favorite podcast-providing website and searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. You can also go to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, clicking on the radio tab at the top of the page for full length or the highlight tab on the right-hand side for segments of all past shows. Until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. You have been listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. Tell a friend and join Joy and Holly again next week so we can all grow together. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show is a production of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com in association with WI Garden Media Broadcast, live from the WNOV 860 AM and the W293CX 106.5 FM, Courier Communication Studios in Milwaukee, Wisconsin.